So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome and kick off session C. We are going to have our moderator, Ms. Kathy Richards, who will moderate this panel discussion on financing gender responsive social protection and care systems. Ms. Richards is the country manager for Oxfam in Laos. Previously, she was the country director for Oxfam in Timor-Leste. Ms. Richards has worked for the Australian Government Aid Program for Timor-Leste and the Philippines and as the manager of Equality Rights Alliance. Now, the panelists in today's session are Ms. Evelyn Estor. Ms. Estor is the advisor on economic and social policy at the International Trade Union Confederation and she provides specialist advice and support to trade unions on employment and social policy issues, including on minimum living wages, social protection, and job creation. We also have Mr. Stephen Kidd, who is the Principal Social Protection Specialist at Development Pathways. He was previously the Director of Policy at Help Age International, led, and, and led DIFD's social protection team, and was a lecturer in social anthropology at the University of Edinburgh. We also have Ms. Ma Victoria Marivic, who is the co-convener of Social Watch Philippines and is a member of the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors. She is an associate professor at the National College of Public Administration and Governance, University of Philippines, Diliman, where she teaches courses on poverty, inequality, the developmental stage, state and governance, and social policy. Now, to our panelists, with the translators doing real time, we just encourage you to speak a little bit slower. I'm guilty of that as well. So just gentle reminder, we just got to slow it down a tad bit so the translators can keep up with us and keep a fluid, a, a very smooth flow for the entire forum. Over to you, Ms. Cathy, and the entire panelists. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. Um, what a wonderful, warm welcome. 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 And, and what a privilege to be the moderator with these impressive panelists that we have. Um, before we go to the questions that we have with our panelists, um, just a reminder again about those questions. We will be taking questions at the end of the panel discussions. So as you're going through and listening to our speakers with their insights and wise words, um, think about the questions that you would like to ask and you can pop them in Slido or at the end, raise your hand on the Zoom function. I'm going to set the scene a little bit and then we'll get right into it with some questions from our three speakers today. So despite the progress that's been made in the last few decades, social protection continues to be underdeveloped in Southeast Asia with many significant gaps and underinvestment. In many Southeast Asian countries, there are no schemes for necessary social protection contingencies. And that responsibility for provisions such as maternity, sickness, and employment injury benefits falls to employers. Many countries in Southeast Asia spend less than 2% of their gross domestic product on social protection. Investment in basic social protection would have an immediate impact on reducing poverty, inequality, and purchasing power disparities, and would address COVID repercussions and challenges. So with that scene setting, let me go to our first speaker. And Stephen, this question is to you. Public financing for social protection, it's often not seen as an investment in long-term development or in employment. How can we change that narrative? How can we change it to a narrative of greater public financing and greater fiscal space for social protection? I think we're just waiting for Stephen to come off mute. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to unmute myself, but um, yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a great question. And I think it's um, always important in these kind of questions to, you know, to look at history and look at, you know, how, uh, how some countries became successful economically, politically and socially. If you look at high income countries, um, they started investing in social protection many, many years ago couple of hundred years ago, but particularly after the Second World War, there was a significant increase in investment when these countries were much, much poorer than they are now. 
and the, and and this investment has been a key part of the sort of social, political, and economic success of of these countries. So we find nowadays that the average level of investment in social social protection or social security is around twelve percent of GDP across high income countries, way higher than the figures that you're 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 citing. And even I think Cathy, the figures you're citing are really social protection for a very small proportion of the population is benefit. The vast majority are excluded. And in, 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 in most countries, social protection is seen as a core public service, one of the critical core public services alongside health and education, and usually has higher levels of investment than, than both. So we need to really position this as something that's absolutely essential for all states to, to, to provide. Now then we need to convince policymakers about why they should invest in something where we can see it's been very, very successful elsewhere in the in, in, in the world. And of course, there's very many indef different incentives that we have to identify for, for policymakers. For some, and it's been very successful, it's about, you know, these are very popular measures. It's about you can increase the popularity. That's a great incentive for some policymakers, particularly in a more democratic in, in, in environments. Uh, and, and many politicians just want to improve the lives of their citizens by giving them access to regular income in addition to the meager resources that many people have, particularly those in the informal economy. This is, this is really important for some policymakers. But for others, we have to make other, other arguments. And this is around where we get to the arguments to convince them that it's not just a cost, which is what we hear all the time, but this is a real investment in economic growth. And there's many ways in which social protection supports economic growth. One is it builds your human capital of the country. It makes you eventually a better skilled and much more productive workforce. And how do we do that? It's by investing in children and allowing mothers and fathers to be able to do this investment in, in children. And it's insufficient just to provide health and education services for children, because if one of the major constraints you have is a lack of income and insufficient income, which means you can't give enough for your kids to, 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 to eat of good quality food. And we know that stunting is a massive problem in Southeast Asia, which affects the cognitive development of kids. If we can invest in kids early on, help them get a school and provide them also with a better home environment by having higher incomes, then we're gonna build much higher, a much more skilled workforce. And that's gonna help economic growth. And that's, you know, that in longer term. It's also going to provide many families by having a regular and predictable income uh, every month that they know they can put the food on the table for their kids. Then that gives them the, the, the confidence to perhaps enter into more risky activities, in, in income generating activities or to find employment. And which can be really important if you take a bit more risk, you're going to get much more reward. And if your risk fails, you know you've got something to fall back on. And we see the evidence of people taking more risks and getting more income and doing even better. And that feeds into economic growth as well. Thirdly, um, this is, social protection is a key part of driving um, um, uh, demand in the economy, more consumption and bigger markets. Let's imagine your economy is like a car. How does a car get to go? Well, we know we need electric cars, everybody, but in the absence of electric cars um you know we need to put fuel petrol into our into our cars or they won't go with an economy if there's no cash in an economy then the economy will not go we need to put cash into the economy if we put cash into the economy people spend that provides opportunities for entrepreneurs that provides jobs for everyone and that's one part of the success. The 12% of GDP on average that high income countries are investing is going into spending and creating markets for everyone. And that's helping economic growth. And that's why many countries to get out of the COVID-19 crisis are throwing cash and more and more cash into their economies to boost spending. The ITUC for which Evelyn is at has done a great report um, with us uh, at Development Pathways which is really explaining the kind of impacts you can get by throwing cash into your economy and how this drives more economic growth, more, um, more employment and more tax. So that's really, really important. And finally, um, um, is it, about building the social contract. It's critically important that we have peaceful societies social con with a strong social contract. In that, we're gonna attract an investment 
in, into countries. Countries don't want to go where they're at risk of, of you know, violence. More peaceful society is going to attract in more, more investment. And this is what we can get from, from social protection. But my final point is we need to think about the type of social protection. We can get this through universal social protection, where we provide social protection as an entitlement for everyone. If we continue by just targeting the very poorest members of society, which can never be done accurately, that is in danger of undermining everything. It creates disincentives to, to, to work. It undermines the social contract because it's seen as very, very arbitrary and doesn't put a much, it, and, and doesn't lead to high spending programs. So it doesn't put cash, cash in hands and it doesn't create m- many incentives for politicians to become popular because they're giving it to the only a minority of the population. So all of these factors will help drive it. And we have to convince policymakers that they need to do this because this will help economic growth and generate employment. Strong, strong arguments, Stephen. Economic arguments, political arguments, building human capital arguments. Um, Before I go to uh, the next question, um, just a reminder, the interpreters have asked us all to slow down a little bit. And I know we've got so much we want to say, so just for the three panellists, just slow down. We've got plenty of time in the session. Evelyn, let's keep talking about that fiscal space um, issue. Is it always an issue of not having fiscal space? What about the political will? What about political will that's informed by solidarity and rights-based approaches? That's a great question, Kathy. And indeed, governments tend to cite a lack of fiscal space as the main reason for not introducing or delaying the rollout of comprehensive social protection schemes or improving benefit levels. But the truth is really much more nuanced than simply that there's not enough money. And the ILO has actually done some really important research estimating financing gaps for extending social protection in line with ILO standards. And the evidence shows that broadly speaking, financing social protection is actually economically feasible for the vast majority of the world's countries. And there are actually a variety of means at government's disposal to create fiscal space and raise revenue for social protection. Um, I'm not going to be exhaustive, but I would like to just name a few modalities at government's disposal for us to think about. Um, First is leveraging progressive forms of taxation, corporate taxes, wealth taxes, financial transaction taxes, which can actually help ensure that those who can afford to pay more into social protection uh, should do pay more. And in this respect, what's, what's a bit troubling is that Oxfam research last year revealed that many countries have lowered progressive forms of taxes, such as wealth, over the last decades. So that's actually undermining the ability of having a solid and fair financing base for social protection and something that we should think about. And it's really good that G7 countries have now made some commitments for minimum corporate tax, and I hope that that can um, can indeed serve as a, as a benchmark for, uh, for other countries as well. Um, The second has to do with reallocating and reprioritizing public expenditures in order to prioritize delivering on the right to social protection. I think that uh, policymakers need to ask themselves, what is really critical? Um, You know, what should they prioritize? Uh, Social protection is an internationally recognized human right, and uh, fiscal space should be earmarked to deliver on that right. And perhaps uh, they should look at where there are other aspects of spending Uh, that are not so critical in terms of human rights, social and economic development. Um, The third has to do with ensuring that employers pay their fair share of social security contributions. And what's a bit worrying from this crisis actually is that, uh, and also as a a follow-up to the last crisis, is that many governments have reduced or even suspended employers' obligations to pay social security contributions. Um, as a means of lowering labor costs, trying to incentivize job creation, although the evidence for uh, lowering labor costs and, hi- uh, and its result on hiring is not so clear. So this is, this is problematic. It jeopardizes, again, the financing base for social protection, and it shifts the burden of financing onto workers. Um, then, of course, there's the issue of tackling tax evasion and addressing illicit financial flows. And uh, the IMF has estimated that approximately 7 trillion US dollars, that's around 10% of the global GDP is held up in tax havens. 
And just to put that into perspective, less than 1% of GDP is needed in order to actually finance social protection for uh, the vast majority of the world's population. Um, supporting the formalization of the informal economy, and I believe this was discussed yesterday, around 70% of the workforce in Asia Pacific is working in the informal economy, and around 60% of the global workforce. And supporting formalization does not only strengthen the rights and protections available to these workers, but it can also broaden the basis for taxes and social security contributions. And allowing informal workers to also make voluntary contributions into the system can strengthen the financing base, um, reduce dependence on non-contributory schemes, um, because many informal workers actually want to be able to contribute into the system and receive social security, but there's no legal framework allowing them to do it. And what we know from experiences in the Dominican Republic, Uruguay, and elsewhere is that by providing informal workers the opportunity to contribute can actually serve as a powerful incentive to uh, register, declare earnings, and, and to formalize. And as Stephen mentioned, I think it's, it's really important for governments to look at social spending as an investment and not just in terms of deadweight costs. And if we come back to the report that Stephen mentioned, a report that Development Pathways conducted for the ITUC and which was published this year, it highlights that increased investments in social protection can yield between 0.7 and 1.9 times their value in economic returns. What that means is that the economic benefits of social spending can offset partially or completely the costs. And so this also needs to be taken into account when discussing fiscal space for social protection. And I'll be happy to link that, that report later into the chat if you'd like to see more details about that. Um, finally, I would just like to say a word around international solidarity in financing and the political will that's also needed there, because even with the variety of measures that governments have to expand fiscal space for social protection at the domestic level, there are, of course, some countries, especially those least developed countries, that still may find it challenging to create sufficient fiscal space on their own. The ILO has estimated that around 78 billion US dollars would be needed to close social protection financing gaps. Uh, within low-income countries. And that's, again, a fraction of a percent of, of global GDP, but it represents over 15% of the collective GDP of these countries and around 45% of their collective tax revenue. So this is an unsurmountable burden unless there's international support. Um, this really um, highlights the importance of strengthening um, official development assistance uh, and less than 1% of overall ODA currently goes to social protection, despite its positive contribution to economic and social development. So we need to ask ourselves, what can we can we do more to actually reorient ODA towards social protection? But there's also a discussion going on actually today within the Human Rights Council um, for the establishment of a global social protection fund. Uh, and this was also a proposal that was subject to extensive discussion between governments, employers and workers at the International Labor Conference two weeks ago. Um, the idea of this fund, which has been put forward by Olivier de Scooter, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, um, would be to catalyze social protection funding for those countries where the funding gaps are too acute for, the, for them to be able to cover it on their own in the short term. In other words, low-income countries, those experiencing financial shocks, and the aim would be to help them build up adequate and sustainable social protection systems over the long run. And just to say that the global labor movement is extremely supportive of this proposal. We see this as an act of international solidarity that can actually bridge the gap between those countries with strong social protection systems and those that don't have the capacity to build them up and can actually unite the world on a path towards a more equitable recovery from this pandemic. And I'll be happy to also share more in the chat around this. I'll stop here, thanks. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Many, many great points there. I will note that Stephen has put links to a number of those reports in the chat box. So friends, I see we are more than 160. Um, as you're following through and listening to our panelists, have a look in the chat box and you can see many of the reports that Evelyn and Stephen have just been mentioning. Um, let me go to our third panelist, Victoria. Um, lovely to have you joining us. Uh, I want to introduce a concept, and I hope I say the word correctly, um, hypothecated tax revenue. Under the question that I want to put to you is, under what conditions can hypothecated tax revenue build transformative social protection systems? Mm. 
Okay. Um, good afternoon to everyone. At least here in ASEAN, it's in the afternoon. So hello to all. I think in other parts of the world, it's already evening or morning. Anyway, you know, when I was first invited to, to speak on the topic of financing for social protection, quite frankly, I was unsure about how to approach uh, this broad topic. And I'll get to your specific question in a while, uh, Kathy. Because quite frankly, I'm not an economist or much less a fiscal expert. But I realized that as a homemaker, a co-homemaker, I know plenty about what matters, which is caring for myself, my family, and my community, and how important it is to set aside resources for those that we value most. Food on the table, education for our children, how do we keep our immune system strong to fight COVID, to name a few, and so ensuring that we have resources for these. Now, what this pandemic has really underscored is how important the centrality of care. On a bigger and public scale, one of the clearest ways to show how much we value the notion and practice of care is to reflect this in our budget. In other words, to put public funds where our public rhetoric is. And as we know, budgets really are a concentrated expression of what our development priorities are. So going back to the question, no, Kathy, hypothecating, or in my part of the world, we call it earmarking, okay? Earmarking revenues from taxes uh, is the practice of setting aside a chunk of your revenues generated from a specific tax so that it will fund an, a specific expenditure item. So under what conditions will this work? First of all, let's say that there is a whole debate about whether we want to do earmarking or not, especially among policymakers. There are the pros and the cons to this. Um, those who are against it argue that it reduces the flexibility of governments in allocating resources. So they don't want to hypothecate or earmark. Furthermore, some critics argue that earmarking taxes create poor incentives for the improvement of certain programs, government programs, and of even entire institutions, because they will be assured of funding every year without tying it to development performance or outcomes. No? So it's a, it creates, they say, poor incentives. Also, a lot of the times, it is not easy to verify, verify if the earmarked revenues were actually spent for that expenditure that it was supposed to go to, okay? Now, having said all this, I believe that there are still very strong justifications for earmarking funds for social protection, especially those that benefit women's needs. And this is also particularly underscored for developing countries that, as many of our friends around the table have said, lack fiscal space. No? Dedicating, for example, revenues from a tax to strengthen public daycare programs will allow poor women more time for self-care and to look for paid work, for example. And it's a, it is a demonstration of political will on the part of policymakers to prioritize and value the work and the time of women because they are already earmarking funds for public daycare programs. So, you know, policymakers, especially when it comes to the budget process, they're faced with so many competing priorities. So by earmarking specific funding, uh, for example, for, from certain revenues, no? um, this is a way of making sure that that important expenditure item is prioritized and is not left to the political whims and vagaries of, of the legislative processes, which we know can go either and any way. So in a way, by earmarking our taxes also, the link between tax revenue and government spending is much more transparent and it is easier for the public to determine where the money, where their money is going and what will be required for them to be able to pay uh, for that expenditure because they know where the taxes they're paying is going to. Now, let me be uh, more concrete and give an example which is, for example, the sin tax, 
what is the syntax? This is the amount of revenue generated by increasing the tax rates applied to tobacco and alcohol. And a syntax uh, has been implemented in many ASEAN countries, including Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines, no? Singapore. In fact, Philippines, Thailand, and Singapore have the biggest tax rates. And I understand in Thailand, their syntax revenues go directly and automatically to a health promotion foundation that conducts public education and awareness raising on health and focuses on other prevention, uh, other prevention interventions against, uh, for example, the negative impact of smoking. I'm sure our friends from Thailand can speak more about this. Same in Indonesia, their tobacco tax goes directly to their local government units for their tobacco control programs. Again, our friends from Indonesia, I hope, can share more on this. In the Philippines, we also have a syntax, which was uh, enacted into law in 2012 after intense lobbying from civil society and other groups. And at one point, we generated, what, about $120 million a year. And that money, that, that additional funding that has been generated for, by, by, for the syntax has been earmarked to fund our recently enacted universal health care law. And it was very specific that 85% of sin taxes that have been generated should go to public health programs, to the premiums of our country health insurance, and funding local government health centers. No? So, and then the, fifth, the remaining 15% of the sin tax will go to fund alternative livelihoods for tobacco growing farmers because we we want them to transition out of uh, out of out of uh, what do you call it? growing tobacco eh, in their in their place in their farms so having said this so we want we yes earmarking funding for for social protection programs is is is, is a good way of prioritizing no social protection programs but i want to caution that it is not a magic bullet just because you have additional revenues uh, to go to a good program does not mean automatically development outcomes for increased support for women will happen. There are things that we need to look at, like the administrative capacity or technical competence of the agencies to run this program. No? So it, it's not, and then also we have to make sure that there will there might be leakage, corruption in the process. So in all of this citizens and women's participation is critical in determining how the revenues generated from, this, from these earmarked funds uh, will be used at all stages of, of program implementation. So citizens monitoring, again, I, uh, I would like to underscore to help extract accountability and make sure that these programs are truly responsive to people's needs. So I'll end there, Kath, uh, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much. So many, uh, so much rich information. I really like the examples that you were giving there. And I can see friends are already putting some questions through in the chat. So um, when we come to the end of the panelists, we'll be able to go to your questions. Evelyn, um, let's go to you next. And I want to talk about gender impacts. We're talking about social protection to um, empower women. What are the possible gender impacts of different financing models for social protection? Thanks, Kathy. And I'm glad you asked that question because this is an important one, even though at first glance it doesn't seem, it seems a bit technical. Actually, the overall structure for, of financing for social protection can have very gendered impacts. Um, if you look first at contributory financing models for social security systems, uh, this is typically the main financing model for social protection, um, providing income replacement benefits that cover the general population. Uh, contributions are generally financed through a division of employer and worker contributions. And these schemes are important because they allow workers income security during periods temporarily or permanently out of employment. But um, in, in some countries, uh, benefits are strictly linked to one's contribution history. Uh, in other cases, contributory systems have uh, solidarity elements built into them. For example, providing a minim minimum benefit level for everyone, uh, even if you've made small levels of contributions. 
Um, but in general, contributory systems, especially when the benefits are strongly linked to the uh, contributions put in, they very often tend to mirror gender, gender inequalities in the labor market, meaning that women's low pay, uh, their lower employment rates, their higher concentrations in part-time uh, and precarious forms of work, informal work, uh, more gaps in their careers due to care that leads to lower contributions than men and therefore lower benefits. And in, um, in many non-standard and precarious forms of work, uh, domestic work, agency work, zero-hour contracts, et cetera, um, which women tend to be overrepresented in, um, employers are actually exempt from paying contributions. Um, and the result is that um, overall, according to the ILO, globally only around 25% of women are covered by a contributory old age pension. Um, there are nevertheless ways to partially uh, mitigate such inequalities in contributory systems. So for example, providing credits for contributions during periods of care um, for women, for, for children or for other relatives that can that help mitigate the disadvantages that women face because of career interruptions in contributions. Um, and the vast majority of OECD countries provide some sort of contribution credit to compensate for unpaid care work. Um, it's also possible to have higher rates of employ employer contributions or subsidized contributions by the state uh, for those on lower incomes, which can help workers build up more contributions and also address the problem of low contributory capacity for workers on low, low incomes. Um, making sure, again, that employers pay their fair share of contributions, irrespective of the, the type of employment contract, that's also very important. Uh, so reducing regulatory arbitrage and the possibility for employers to select um, precarious forms of work because they are not obliged to pay social security contributions. Um, and then as I, as I sort of alluded to before, uh, putting in place <clears throat> redistributive components into contributory systems, meaning that you can put higher replacement rates, for example, for low income earners than those with higher earners. I'll give you an example of Turkey. Um, they provide about uh, they, nearly 100% replacement rate for low-income earners in their social security system as compared to 60% uh, for the top earners. Uh, and again, having um, minimum levels of, of benefits in the contributory system, that can also help. Um, now, moving on to non-contributory systems, um, these generally relate to benefits and services that are provided to people irrespective of their contribution history, uh, generally financed through uh, taxation. Um, these schemes very often consist of social assistance benefits, guaranteed income support benefits, uh, and women tend to be overrepresented in the receipt of these benefits precisely because they are excluded often from the contributor contributory schemes. Um, the problem here is that the levels of non-contributory schemes tend to be rather low. Uh, so, of course, ensuring the adequacy of these systems, of these benefits, is also very important. Uh, it's also important to point out that non-contributory schemes are often uh, subject to stringent conditionalities. They're often means-tested, uh, therefore taking into account household income. So if a woman is in a household where a partner works, the assumption is often that the income is shared between them, and this is often not the case. Uh, and this has a negative consequence on women's access to the benefits and their economic independence. Um, in some cases, like conditional cash transfers, uh, benefits are sometimes accompanied with specific requirements, like taking children to doctor's appointments or making sure that children attend school. Um, and these conditionalities are based on the assumption that poor households would otherwise not invest in children's human capital. Um, they create large administrative requirements that fall on women, reinforcing them into the role of primary caregiver in the household. So um, really re-evaluating um, re whether such conditionalities are necessary for non-contributory schemes, I think that's also important to, to bear in mind. Um, and finally, I think uh, cutbacks to the levels of non-contributory benefits and the strengthening of eligibility criteria um, in many years under the guise of fiscal sustainability um, have disproportionately penalized women because, again, they're the main users of these schemes and they're um, often excluded because of the stringent conditionalities. Um, I just want to say that uh, you know, I've highlighted the, the sort of um, downsides of, of both kinds of schemes, but 
Um, in fact, coverage of social protection uh, tends to be the greatest and the gender gaps tend to be the lowest. When you have social protection schemes that contain a comprehensive mix of contributory and non-contributory um, schemes. And in fact, two weeks ago, we had the tripartite social security discussion at the International Labor Conference. That's where workers, governments, and employers reaffirmed the need to complement adequate social protection floors with higher levels of um, contributory social security based on the principle, principles of solidarity and collective risk pooling. I think that those conclusions are important for us to bear in mind. And moreover, it reaffirmed the need for non-contributory systems to have adequate benefit levels um, and that contributory schemes should be gender responsive and therefore credit social security contributions for care work in order to reduce gender gaps in benefit levels and coverage. I think that this, was, this is a huge um, achievement to, to actually come to an agreement between um, workers, uh, employers, and and uh, and governments on this, and I'm I'm happy also to share the conclusions. I think that this can be a, an important uh, guideline for states as they're thinking about how to strengthen gender uh, responsive social protection and how to finance that. Thank you, thank you, Evelyn. I'm sure everybody would be really interested to to hear more from that international conference. Um, I'm going to keep this moving along. And uh, Stephen, the next question is to you. Um, brace yourself, we're going to be talking about COVID. We, we can't have a discussion on anything without looking at the context that we're, we're in with the global pandemic. What we have seen is that there's been increasing discussions on the role of care economy as a way of building forward better following COVID and as being essential in creating a fairer economy. So can you talk about what a care economy means and what measures governments can take to invest in care systems? Um, thanks, Cathy. I'll try and speak slower. The problem is I thought I was speaking slower the last time and <laughs> it turns out I wasn't. So I'll try and um, help the interpreters even more um, now. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we, we often really just forget about the, the, the care economy and the large proportion of, of, of people around the world who have responsibilities to care for others, right? And, and, and you know, many of us will require care. At, well, all of us require care at some point of our li lives. When children, when we're born, we, we require intense care and support from both parents, but particularly the, the mother. If you have a disability, um, you know, many people with se very severe, profound disabilities require a lot of care. Many people with disabilities, we need to remember, are perfectly autonomous and just need a little bit of support to get by by themselves. But some people need a lot of care with very profound disabilities. And it's uh, <coughs> particularly difficult for, for families who are bought, have a, a disabled child, um, you know, to, who, who needs intense support and medical support and, and, and other kind of a support services to, to, to work at the, at the same time as providing that kind of care. I, I know this, I have a, a disabled daughter and it was impossible um, for both my wife and I to work when, we, when, when, when she was um, very young and we wouldn't have got by without support from, from the state. But of course, as we all age at some point, we're, we're probably all going to become disabled and frail and requiring support from others. And we don't want to be put into a home. We like to stay in our own homes. And often that means somebody else from our family, our children, has to take care of us. And this, this affects many, many people globally. And the problem is that if you have to spend a lot of your time providing this care support, you're unable to work. And therefore, that is going to hit your family income dramatically. Not only your family income because you can't work, but often if you have care responsibilities, you have much higher costs, medical costs, etc., to for, for, for the person that you're taking care of. So it's critically important in a fairer, decent society that we provide those carers with that support. Because in a sense, what they're doing is they're taking over responsibility of the state. But if the state doesn't step in to do it, it's kind of a relatively arbitrary measure. It's kind of an arbitrary tax on some individuals who may have care responsibilities and others don't. And the people with the care responsibilities have, have to give up a lot and, and, and end up with much lower standards of, of, of living with those who don't do better. And, and, and the state needs to step in to kind of equalize that 
burden in a state of solidarity. That's why we have governments, is to create fairer societies, is to create that. And therefore, they need to step in to provide this kind of support. And we don't find in many low middle income countries the, the kind of support that is required. So the kind of measures that we should be really looking at um, once we ba build basic social security systems that provide everybody you know, with support, children, old age, disability, unemployment benefits, is these additional benefits that need to be in place. Critically important, um, I think Evan has all, all already mentioning about, about maternity and paternity benefits um, as well, that is critically important. You give you give birth to a child, you need to dedicate time to that child's development. You need time off work. To take time off work, somebody needs to provide you with that with, with, with that support and that systems need to be put in place. You can achieve that through insurance measures for people who are in the formal economy, but we have to find ways to provide the, those kind of measures for those in the informal economy who are out of work by providing people with those additional benefits so that they don't feel obliged to work and therefore reduce the time that they can spend with their children, which is going to set them back. And particularly if they have um, children with disabilities, we need much more additional support. And I think this is where the, the role of, of um, um, caregivers benefits are really, really important. Now, Vietnam, I think, has, a, has, a, has some example of a caregiver's benefit, which is really about if somebody has to give up work because they have to provide care to disabled children or other people with profound disabilities or the older parents and they're forced to do that, the state needs to step in to compensate them in some way with some kind, what is effect a salary, right? In, in that you're providing a service because if you didn't provide that service, who's gonna provide? It's the state, right? We're, we're stopping, particularly with adults, being sent into homes, which is gonna be very, very expensive. And often many countries don't provide that by people keeping them at home taking on that, uh, that that responsibility. Let's not call it a burden because, you know, we're, we're caring for people that we love, but taking on that responsibility. And so the state steps in as an example of solidarity from the taxes that we all pay are then directed to those who need the most through these caregivers um, benefits. And, and, and these are absolutely essential to, to, to be provided to, 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 to people. And we see a few examples in low and middle income countries of this. But it's also really important, I think, to not forget, nothing can just be resolved through cash, right? There, there needs to be many other areas of, of support that need to be put in place. One thing that countries need to be doing is, and this is where the, I think the, where we've diverted, you know, we've put a lot of attention on providing cash benefits. We need to provide social, strong social work systems really build strong social work systems with professional social workers who can go and work with society families that are struggling um, because of the, these care responsibilities and give them that additional tailored support to that family and put together a package of support you know um, that can help that particular family with those particular needs and this is a lot of investment not in the sort of um just in cheap community workers, which is what often what social work is turned into, but proper professional social work as a, as a, as a real profession that's in, that, that has proper levels of investment and has a social care package beside it to often help families and individuals, hopefully to stay in their own home by, by having people providing them with, 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 with services. And of course, this, this kind of broader care support in terms of employing people to provide care support can help generate employment post-COVID as, as, as well. We can generate a lot of jobs. In my own country, in the UK, 3 million people are employed providing care support to others. 3 million people. I mean, imagine the unemployment levels we would have in the UK if we didn't have that. And that all comes from government funding, often put through the private sector or through NGOs, but it's government funding from our taxes that is there. And this is critically important. That can generate jobs and lots of jobs. And that those jobs and that cash will generate spending and will help economies um, recover and it'll help the most vulnerable individuals in society. Evelyn's already talked about, you know, crediting um, people who are out of work, um, you know, who can't um, um, contribute to social insurance schemes that 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 needs to be put in place. I won't talk about that. But just one final plea. And I think this is particularly important for for women and, and Evelyn's already sort of alluded to it, you know, 
countries need to be putting in place old age pension systems, right, for everybody. Now, we have to remember the reality is the state doesn't provide everything. Often, and you can see in Europe, a lot of the support of families is provided by grandparents and, and older people who are still very, very active, can still provide support, but they can do it way more effectively if they're provided with old age pensions. And this is where we can see the, the absolute importance of every person being able to access a tax financed old age pension that uh, is provided from the state, gives everybody the, the, the power in their old age while they still can to be able to volunteer, provide support, provide support to their families, provide support into their communities on a voluntary basis. And we can generate that by providing everybody with an old age pension. And of course, those who will most benefit from that will be women. One, because most older people tend to be women. And as Evelyn says, most women are, the, uh, women are those who are disadvantaged in the social insurance system and need that support. And I think that is also a fundamental benefit that needs to be in place, which will help a broader care economy by empowering older people um, also. So I'll, st I'll, I'll stop then. Hopefully I was a bit slower that time. I'm sure it's a thumbs up from the interpreters. No, thank you, Stephen. Um, and and what, you've, what you've brought in there in, in regards to um, children with disabilities, caring responsibilities, um, elderly relatives, uh, you know, many of those things are going to resonate with, with all of us here. And there'll be things that are very, very close to many of our, our individual experiences. So I'm sure you've, you've, you've touched a nerve, a positive nerve with, with many of the participants. Um, Victoria, I'm going to go to you for our final question from the panelists. And then I already see we have a number of questions in the chat box. So we'll then move to the questions from the participants. Victoria, my, quest, my final question, I think, is something that's also going to really resonate with many people who are here listening to, to you today. And that's about the role of civil society organisations and women's movements. Could you let us know, just share what you think the role of civil society organisations and women's movements in influencing governments to create appropriate fiscal space that responds to people's needs? What is that role? And how do we get there? Right. Um, if there's one thing I learned in all my years as an activist, it is that if we want public policies and programs to benefit the poor and socially excluded, including women, no? uh, the balance of power must be tipped in their favor. This means we cannot leave the formulation of policies, programs, and allocation of public funds solely in the hands of politicians and bureaucrats, no matter how well-meaning they are. Um, citizens' movements, composed of and with strong ties with subaltern groups, women's and feminist organizations, must be strong enough to influence public policy making. And this can be done through a variety of ways, such as by voting progressive candidates, through intense lobbying with parliamentarians, by direct political action through the time-honored uh, time -honored arenas of the parliament of the streets, the calling of boycotts. You know, are these are just some of the examples. So that public policies and programs that strengthen well-being uh, are adequately uh, supported, especially in terms of funding. So this means rejecting, for example, technocratic styles of decision-making which limit the involvement of citizens' groups and women's groups in policy-making processes. Okay. So here, in order to tip the balance of power, uh, we can effectively uh, do this, no? movements groups, social movement groups, CSOs, women's groups, um, and help effectively claim our rights in education, health, employment, the care economy, through public awareness raising, political education, not just on issues of the day, but the structural root causes of the issues that we face. So that's one, political education and awareness raising through massive and painstaking organizing among, among the various sectors like informal workers, domestic and migrant workers, uh, among women's groups to name a few important groups. And of course, through mass mobilization to be able to exert political pressure and get policymakers to listen, to listen and make policies and programs 
that benefit us the most. Now, in this regard, I'd like to share, for example, the experience of my organization, Social Watch Philippines. No? We launched what we call the Alternative Budget Initiative in 2006. Uh, we worked with about 200 citizens' organizations. These were organizations working for the rights of children, persons with disabilities, women's rights, as well as on education, health, social protection, agriculture, and environment. So the, I, the idea of the project, the alternative budget project, was to be able to increase social spending for programs that we thought would benefit you know, the poor and socially excluded in, in our society the most. So we took it upon ourselves to engage the budget process. As you know, budget making can be very technical in terms of content and process, but we taught ourselves how to read and understand the voluminous reports of government in terms of the budget. We taught ourselves how to, the legislative process, and we built ties with legislators. We identified who were more sympathetic and who weren't. And we did three things every year. We assessed you know, the, the budget that was presented, what were the government's priorities and allocations every year. And then we proposed uh, increased, we proposed a, a program to increase funding for key, pro, for key development programs, no? either education, health. And then not only that, we identified alternative sources of where they can get the money from the budget itself. How did we do this? We looked for the fact in the budget. In the national budget of the Philippine government, there are, for example, what you call special purpose funds which are really one-line item budgets that are highly discretionary. You don't really know what it's, where it's going because there's not much of a description. And we call that, so it's prone to corruption no? and it's prone to all kinds of leakages. So we said, if we want to increase spending for textbook for children with disabilities, get the money from this other program. And we would be invited in Congress and we would uh, explain this and defend our proposals. Wonderful. And you know, I'm happy to report that across the years, we have been able to, to increase, for example, funding for textbooks for children with disabilities by about $10 million for one year. We managed that. that inspiring. Thank you. And in another year, we were able to raise about more than $200 million for the construction of health centers. So there have been some gains. Many, many. Um, and I'm sure that um, many people will be interested to learn more about Social Watch Philippines. So I will encourage you to um, follow up and look at the work of Victoria's fantastic organization. Let's keep going. We've got some questions from, from the participants. We still have more than 160 people with us. So um, Evelyn, I'm going to throw the first question to you. Um, it's about fiscal space. I'm going to re read the question on behalf of somebody who submitted it. The question is, fiscal space is a political issue, but social protection rights holders are excluded from fiscal decisions. What needs to happen to shift power in this space? And I'll just ask you to keep your answer to two minutes. Thanks. Sure, um, I think that's a great question. And I think this goes, this relates very much uh, to what Victoria was just talking about in terms of the inclusion of civil society organizations. And I would say also the, the critical role that social partners have to play uh, when it comes to reform discussions, when it comes to um, uh, actually uh, overseeing the implementation of social security reforms as well. Uh, and I should really point out that uh, international labor, labor standards have a very clear framework around the need uh, to involve uh, not just employers, but also workers' organizations in the reform discussions, as well as um, other representative organizations of citizens concerned. Um, and we've seen uh, really great examples of where uh, unions and civil society organizations um, have been meaningfully involved in discussions to extend social protection, for example, in Uruguay, uh, in the discussion around extending social pensions, Kenya as well, um, and we also see how uh, unions and civil society organizations are very important in terms of building momentum for reforms. We know in Indonesia, for example, as a really good example from the region, um, it was thanks to the involvement of unions 
that uh, the 2004 reform, reform for Social Security, um, the, social, the introduction of the Social Security law actually passed. Um, and I would say as well that uh, not only are these groups important in terms of building public momentum, but making sure that social protection systems respond to the needs of those who uh, are benefiting from them, as well as building public trust in the system itself. Beautiful, lovely. Thank you, Evelyn. Stephen, um, let me go to you next with the next question from one of our um, viewers. Um, the question is, if a country is corrupted or experiences corruption, potentially the more budget we allocate for social protection, little will benefit the poor women, children. This is not the equality that we want. Could you make some comments on that? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think, you know, if there is corruption within government, if, if governments are there benefiting themselves and, and, uh, and elites, you know, what is it? It's, you know, hopefully in a democratic pro country, country with a democratic strength, they'll be removed from government in the future. But often that's just not, 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 not challenging. But I think the, the you know, um, often it comes down to the type of social protection that, 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 that we put in place. If you put in place these small poverty targeted programs, they allow much more discretion from um, politicians, local people to, 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 to use corruption to their advantage and to allocate it from one group to another um, to the advantage of, of, of politicians. There's often where we find the, the, the kind of um, you know, uh, use of corruption is to buy often by votes or, or by favors, etc. And there's a lot of corruption in, in, in that way through social protection, through these targeted, small poverty targeted programs. And we see that many, many countries, South Asia is, is full of, of, of this. How to address this really, and this is where we have to build a challenge and have policymakers and politicians with vision is to build universal benefits. Because if benefits are given on an equal basis to everybody and everybody knows exactly what you're meant to receive with very simple criteria. For example, everybody over 65 receives this number of dollars a month. Everybody can monitor whether there's corruption in the system because if you're promised $50 a month and you only receive $30 or you don't receive anything at all, you know there's corruption, okay? And on these universal programs, we find there is much, much less corruption with, within them because everybody is able to monitor what is going on. However, you also find that these programs help generate stronger democracies as well, right? So this is where we find that countries have put in place, many of the countries have put in place these large scale universal programs have generated stronger democracies that's why we've seen you know after the second world war in europe pre-second world war europe was a disaster fascism violence led to the second world war after it when they put in place universal benefits with progressive politicians we got much much stronger democracies that that, that, that developed very different to to the pre-second world war and i think that's the other advantage is that through universal benefits we might build trust in government because I think it's it's absolutely critical that you only build trust through the provision of universal services, not through targeted services. And if we build trust in government, we might find that our policymakers and the people who get into government are people who are much more trustworthy that we can uh, have trust in. So I think it's you know we, it can go both both ways, but I think it is you know let's not give up hope just because there's corrupt politicians. Let's try and change things and 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 get in place benefits for everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. Victoria, let me go to you with the next question from um, one of the participants in today's session. And this is about civic space and, and how we've observed it shrinking under COVID-19. So civic space is shrinking under COVID-19. What is the possibility for citizens to exercise their rights to demand benefits from social protection? Right. Um, you know, the shrinking of civil space is also a function of the fact that because there seems to be, well, there is a national emergency, that then it is a tendency of the state to invoke, in a way, national security type of interventions because of the magnitude and scale of the, of the emergency. 
Uh, so to some extent, uh, that can be justified. But precisely because of the nature of the crisis, all the more we will be needing uh, people's voices to come through to be able to sensitize the government about the scale and dimensions of the crisis, the effectivity of the programs that they are creating that is supposed to mitigate the crisis, and the kinds of solutions that are being put forward. All the more the people have need, need, a, need to have a space to be able to, to intervene, both in the analysis and in the proposals that are being created in terms of ways putting forward. You know, I can, and then now here I will talk about my experiences in the Philippines. Um, many of the people's voices coming through, rallies being organized, are being done always in the context of health protocols that have to be observed. So yes, we have rallies, no? but these are rallies, I don't know, I think I see it in other countries, they have big rallies and they're standing beside each other very closely. But in my context, our rallies are with people that are spaced apart because there's a general fear in, 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 you know, in, in our places. So people are very, at least in the Philippines, and I think in many other ASEAN, in many countries in Asia, we are quite mindful of the health protocols, even when we, when we protest, if you like. And I think it's not one or the other. We can creatively show our voices. We can be able to protest in a manner that is consistent with health protocols. So this is a way of addressing authorities who say, no, you cannot protest, stay home, and that's it. Of course, you can protest online, and that's another way to go. But you, there are now, this is a challenge to many of us to to indulge, engage in creative ways of showing our voices in protesting. Because now more than ever, we cannot be silenced because our voices need to be heard. And I'm happy to say that um, it's happening in many, of our, in many of our countries in the ASEAN. And as I read the media, it's also happening elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love what you were saying there about the creativity of, of activism. And I think that's been long the history of um, activists who've been fighting to maintain that civic space and, and that that struggle continues today, um, especially when, when we, we have COVID. Um, let me go to Stephen. There's another question that I want to send to you. Oh, the chat is moving very fast. And here is the question. The question, Stephen, is there a formula to help the government to allocate budget for social protection programs or to help civil society organisations or citizens to advocate to government for that? Is there a percentage of GDP question? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, the, the, there's no set you know, um, formula um, to, to do it. And, and often depends on the extent to which your country is providing social insurance programs, therefore how much needs to provide through tax finance schemes. But I think there are certain benchmarks that you can put in place for, for countries, for example, um, where you look at the, the, the size of a transfer that should be provided and link it to the, the relative wealth of a, of a country and look at internationally how much should be given, for example, for children, for people with disabilities, for older people. And you can get some kind of benchmarking of the typical value of transfer that could be afforded by, by, um, by, by countries and then calculate that up to how much it would cost. And I think, you know, when we do calculations on that, if I think if you look around the world, you could provide a pretty effective system that provides support to all children, all persons with disabilities and all older people, the kind of core benefits that we require um, at, at, at a relatively generous level at about 3% of GDP. However, while countries might find that difficult to put in, you can build those systems over 10 to 15 years at much lower cost and allow economic growth to finance them while they themselves generate great, greater economic growth. So I think if we're looking at, a, you know, the, on those basic tax finance benefits, if we're looking at a figure of 3% of GDP as our target, that's a kind of figure that um, South Africa, for example, has reached, which has a pretty good um, system in place, which is a sort of model for many um, low middle income um, countries, that I think provides a, a, a good basis on which to, to work. Going beyond that is, is great, but that will, let's remember, it's not a cost, that's an investment. 
that's an investment that will get your economy going. And, uh, you know, and that I think if I had to come out with one number, that would be my target. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Evelyn, I think you might have had some other comments you wanted to add on. Yeah, um, I mean, I fully agree with everything that Stephen has said, and I think that it's not an easy question. It's it's not an easy answer. Um, obviously, the the needs uh, and the specificities of each country differ, so it's hard to say every country country should spend X percent of GDP on on uh, on social protection. That being said, um, there are some tools available produced by the ILO that I think could be really helpful in terms of um, getting an idea of what the specific um, spending needs might be in your countries with regards to social protection floors. The ILO has what they call a, so, uh, a cost calculator where um, you could look at uh, different types of benefits and, and um uh, and how much it would cost for you to uh, introduce or extend those uh, benefits um, in, uh, in your specific countries based on the levels of employment, based on the size of the population, et cetera. Um, and I think that while I, I, I'm not sure that this is a, um, you know, fully, um, you know, fully ac accurate, I think it gives a sort of global snapshot that, that you can use within your advocacy efforts conservative estimates that you could say, you know, uh, at, you know, roughly at least X, it would be needed for this. So I'm happy to share that in the chat. I think that that's a, a useful tool that I know that our affiliates have been using very much to inform um, reform discussions in their countries. Great. Thanks, Evelyn. I can see we have um, someone who's put their hand up and we have just a few minutes left. So I might need the help of our MCs to unmute our friend. I think it's Sapana from Cambodia. When your microphone is unmuted, you may go ahead with your question. Uh, so, uh, with this, may, uh, my name is Sapana. Some talk to you, I get my name. Yeah, I'm ខ្ញុំខ្ញុំបានជួសុបញ្ញាប្រធានយុវកដ្ឋានសុខមាភាពសង្គមនៃ <coughs> ដែលយើងឃើញថាសម្រាប់អ្នកការពង្រឹងបន្ថែមនៅហៅថាការរក្សាបាននៅ <coughs> ក្រុមខាងកម្ពុជាពេលនោះយើងក៏ឬថាបាលកម្ពុជាក៏បានធ្វើការសិក្សាបន្ថែមនៅក្នុងការអឺហៅថាផ្ដល់នៃការអន្
From your perspective, Evelyn, did you have any examples of how you thought care could be provided from the state to the family with a, a member of the family who has a disability? And then how is that linked to help for gender equality inclusion? I hope that that's... Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question, and I think the um, the the challenge of long term care is something that is really under acknowledged as a as a work life balance issue. Um, it's an issue that disproportionately affects women, but uh, but not only women, of course, just just like care responsibilities for children. Um, and and what we know is that uh, in terms of uh, globally speaking, um, when it comes to public support for long term care. Um, very often, uh, this is this is very limited. If you if you compare it to support for childcare, um, this is these are services that are um, often uh, institutionalized, which is uh, neither good for the beneficiary nor the family. So the issue of community based care that Stephen mentioned, uh, which is um, which, which is very important in terms of ensuring dignified livelihoods for uh, for for uh, people. Uh, with with care needs with people with disabilities, um, you know, community based care is is really lacking in in many parts of the world, including in developed countries. Um, and and as a result, um, what you see is that a lot of this work is provided informally, uh, with uh, with people who are providing support without proper qualifications. Uh, and, and in terms of the caregivers, also very limited, if no rights and protections. Uh, uh, economically or uh, or socially, so um, this is something that um, that trade unions have been calling for for a long time in terms of increased investment for quality long term care uh, services, services that are um, that are formal. Um, it can be either through uh, direct provision or through subsidies, but the 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 point is that there needs to be a public um, public investment and regulation around that work and proper qualification and training for uh, long-term care providers as well. And just to say that, uh, I, I go back to, to referencing the discussion that we had at the ILO two weeks ago, uh, but this was very, very critical in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the discussion around not just the need for investment in childcare, which is still very critical, um, but of course also the need for, for long-term care uh, and to ensure uh, decent work within uh, for care jobs as well. Thank you, thank you, Evelyn. I'm I'm getting the nudge from the timekeepers that we need to wrap up the session. But Victoria, I did promise you a final comment on the Global Social Protection Fund. So I'm going to give you literally one minute, and then um, unfortunately someone might come in and mute our microphones. So Victoria, one minute. Right. Well, basically, just to say that even under the COVID nineteen situation. Uh, and the dire need, uh, you know, how the crisis has struck all countries, uh, some more than most, uh, social protection floor, especially financing social protection floor, especially for poor countries, is doable. The, I, the ILO has done a study that for low-income countries, we need about $122 billion, uh, to cover their financing of social protection floor, the minimums really, really for that. And last year, uh, 30 of the richest countries from OECD uh, paid 160 billion. No? So they paid more than, so with 122 billion of the poor countries, it's just less than half of what the, of, of the ODA of the richest countries paid last year. So that means that we have, the money is there to cover the financing gap. What we need is the political will. That's Thank it. Thank, thank you, Victoria. I mean, we are talking, uh, on, on one hand, we're talking about mind staggering figures. And on the other hand, we're talking about things which are absolutely within the global political will and economy reach for us to be able to make these changes for social protection. Um, friends, I'm getting the, the nudge that it's time for us to move to the next part of this afternoon's session. Um, so I invite everybody to show your appreciation to Evelyn, Stephen and Victoria for their wisdom and their insights on this discussion around financing for social protection. Pop your comments of thanks in the chat box, give an applause or um, uh, a celebration emoji out on the chat. Thank you again, Evelyn, Stephen, Victoria. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.
And thank you so much to uh, Kathy for moderating it. We truly hope that every single one of you got something from that. It was a deep dive, a powerful session C. So thanks again to every single one of our speakers and our moderator. We appreciate your time. As we move on with the program, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our next case study. Now, I'd like to welcome Mayor Attorney Melkor Miguel, Mayor of the City of Salcedo, Eastern Samar in the Philippines, to present care ordinances implemented in his city. Now, it is his last term as a municipal mayor after nearly eight years of being the local chief executive of the municipality of Salcedo. He has brought recognition to the municipality as a four-time seal of good local governance as an awardee. Now, given the limited resources that the mayor has had uh, as a fifth-class municipality, he has institutionalized partnerships with NGOs and INGOs to help him accomplish relevant basic services in all areas of local government operations. His municipality is modeling an adaptive, resilient, and disaster-ready community. We will have questions after the presentation. Let's enjoy the case study, or let's learn together right now. Good afternoon, Good afternoon everyone. everyone. Uh, I am Attorney Melchor Liego Mergal, the Municipal Mayor of the Municipality of Salcedo. And it is a privilege and an honor to be a participant of this uh, ASEAN uh, Regional Forum on Social Protection. My topic to be discussed and to be shared to you this afternoon is about our Women Economic Empowerment and Care Ordinance that was uh, piloted by Oxfam in my municipality. This is my uh, uh, third term as municipal mayor and uh, we were a seal of lo good local governance award by the Department of Interior and Local Government where uh, local government units are under of that department. And uh, yes, uh, we enacted an ordinance, a landmark lo local legislation on women in empowerment and care to address unpaid care work. Just a quick fact about my municipality. Uh, we are a fifth class municipality with a total population of 22,835 according to 2015 community-based monitoring systems uh, released by the PSA, the Philippine uh, uh, yeah, it's the, it's the pacing. Then uh, we have 41 villages and uh, two island barangays. And uh, our household is composed of 5,001. And our major sources of income are farming and uh, fishing. Why is it that uh, we have this ordinance? And it is because of uh, the study uh, that was uh, conducted by Oxfam. And they have this outcome or the findings that domestic and care work is often heavy, inefficient, and unequally distributed. The second is that women around the world is spending 20 or two to 10 times more hours on care work than men. And the third is that care work limits women's choices and undermines efforts to achieve gender equality and overcome poverty. This is a worldwide uh, uh, study that was done. And uh, really, I, in the Philippines, for example, this is uh, uh, what is happening. And we, we do agree with this, uh, with this study. And uh, why we do focus on unpaid care? in our municipality and uh, even in the whole uh, Philippines right now. Well, because it is fundamental to human uh, development that there should be gender equality. There should, uh, when it comes to household work, there should be no men or women, boys or girls. It should be the responsibility of all uh, household members uh, to achieve gender equality. Then uh, the second is that there is heavy work burden on women and girls. Well, this is supported by studies by Oxfam and uh, even other organizations or international organizations for that matter. There is really this uh, findings that there is uh, women and girls really devote more time uh, in household works. There, of course, we have this uh, global commitment or the regional commitment, especially our sustainable development goal, as well as the Maputo protocol. 
we are being audited for this because we have to report as regards to the accomplishment uh, regarding SDG 5.4. And uh, the, the next is that women and girls have more choice and benefit more from political, economic, and social participation if they are given the chance to participate, uh, especially in decision makings, in political, as well as economic, social life participation. So. Uh, that is very important that we have to focus on unpaid care work because uh, what is at stake right here is political, economic, as well as social development of every household. And because I am very involved with women economic empowerment in my municipality, I decided to include uh, women economic empowerment as one of my pillars of governance along with education, health and social uh, services, as well as other pillars in my governance. So this would mean that uh, in every development agenda or plan of the municipality, there should have uh, a program or a project or an activity that would involve women economic empowerment, including the budget. So that's it. And uh, in order for us to sustain our uh, social protection initiatives in this municipality, that's why we actually made an ordinance. We called it uh, Women Economic uh, Empowerment and Care Ordinance as one way of uh, addressing uh, household uh, works or, or unpaid care work. Then for the information of everyone in the Philippines, for example, uh, there is this, uh, an ordinance. Uh, an ordinance is actually uh, a local law or a municipal uh, law that is duly enacted by our legislators. Uh, in local government units, uh, we have the executive and we have also the legislative. It is the legislature that uh, creates uh, or pass the law. And uh, it is the executive that actually executes or enforce the, the law. So that is uh, uh, an ordinance just for the information of everyone. And uh, of course, the legal basis in creating ordinance is our the Philippine Constitution of 1987 uh, that stresses uh, local autonomy of all local government units. And uh, enabling law of the local government units is the local government code of uh, 1991. Specifically, the national government uh, ensures decentralization that contributes to the continuing improvement of the performance of local government units and the quality of community life in their respective municipalities. So that is actually the legal basis of our ordinance. As I've mentioned a while ago, uh, our ordinance is uh, composed of uh, four uh, salient uh, features or salient provisions. The, the part one is data collection. Uh, uh, we wanted uh, to know what is the real scenario when it comes to women economic empowerment or household uh, works in our municipality. That's why we wanted to include questions uh, about uh, household work in our community-based monitoring system. Uh, this is a system actually that is used by the local government unit uh, in uh, uh, collecting data in every household. We wanted to know how, how much hour or how many hours does a household uh, devote time for household works, uh, those, those data. Uh, or similar other data that are uh, needed. Then uh, we wanted to also know the compliance with the relevant laws as well as rules and uh, regulations concerning data privacy. Uh, next is the use of household care survey to inform law policy and uh, practice. So this, the, in our ordinance, uh, those are the salient features that in as far as data collection is concerned. Then in part two, we have uh, the objective or we want to attend the, the shifting of social norms uh, through information dissemination, through the gender and development. Uh, we have this uh, guide 
Gender and Development Council or God, God Focal Point System in our municipality. Then uh, we want uh, the elimination of practices that led to provide uh, for uh, mechanisms to offset gender inequality. Then uh, we wanted also to counter negative perceptions about uh, care work. Then the part three, uh, the, the, the next salient feature of our ordinance is the time and labor saving equipment. And uh, as a local government unit, it is the responsibility of the local government unit to provide uh, other time labor saving equipment like uh, any uh, uh, equipment that would uh, reduce the hours of work uh, that is devoted by women and girls in doing household uh, work. Then uh, the, the next is uh, care services as one of the salient features of our uh, municipal ordinance. Uh, of course, uh, the access to safe water, the daycare centers, uh, health centers, these are actually the care services that are being done by women and uh, we wanted to reduce the time. Then uh, the next part is for financial mechanism. Uh, this is already, be because this is already an ordinance, that would mean that uh, there has to be a budget every time or every, every year that uh, there is uh, budgeting by the local government unit. And uh, it is stated there that uh, our women economic uh, empowerment and care uh, funds shall be taken from the 5% gender and development fund uh, that is given to us by the national government. Then uh, what, were the, what were the initiatives of the local government units in as far as women economic uh, empowerment is concerned? And uh, because we already have that ordinance, uh, we have uh, areas regarding cash transfers, awareness raising, and public works programs. I mentioned this a while ago while I was discussing with uh, our ordinance. And uh, yes, uh, one of the initiatives of the local government units, in uh, especially in cash transfer area, uh, we do uh, these sessions with husband and wife. In uh, There is this uh, program of the DSWD. Uh, the four-piece program of the DSW there, where there is this family session and we inject uh, unpaid economic, uh, unpaid care work in that uh, sessions. Also, uh, we have this very deep project in our municipality, the building uh, resilient and disaster ready communities. Uh, we do the preemptive cash transfer so that during uh, evacuation, our women and girls will not be it's not hard enough for them to prepare for, for their households as well as during the evacuation. Uh, as if they have the money, they can buy whatever uh, basic necessities. Then the next is awareness raising. Uh, we, we, we used to purchase time labor saving equipment like uh, cooking stove, rice cooker, kitchen utensils, among others, just to, uh, to help our, our women in uh, those uh, household works. Uh, during our public as well as uh, mass, God, mass our individual weddings, uh, we inject unpaid care work there. Uh, in my case, I do civil weddings and I used to inform my, uh, in, I, I used to inform couples who wanted to have the civil wedding regarding the responsibilities that it should be that unpaid care work or that it should be the responsibility of both husband and wife to do the household works in, the, in their family. Then the local government unit of Salcedo also celebrated Valentine's Day and Women's Month celebration with unpaid care work as steam. And on my part, uh, during our League of Municipalities, uh, I used to share to them uh, our ordinance and uh, they appreciate it very much. And uh, there was this one occasion where I was invited to talk about uh, disaster reduction and climate change adaptation, and uh, I injected also uh, unpaid care work uh, for the newly elected officials in uh, in the region, actually in Region Eight. So those are uh, some kind of an awareness raising regarding unpaid care work, and of course uh, another area in, of initiative that we have is public works program. 
Uh, we do water systems projects in our municipality, uh, sanitation uh, projects also, and uh, farm to market roads, as well as in the disaster risk reduction, among others. As I've told you before, uh, women economic empowerment has been my pillar, and that would mean that there is this corresponding programs, projects, and activities that are allotted uh, for that pillar. Then, uh, uh, of course, uh, on my part as municipal mayor, I've been uh, an advocate for this. And uh, we did this because we understand uh, the current realities that we have in our municipality, that there is really this gender gaps. I know this is not only happening in my municipality, but maybe in other parts of the country and uh, ASEAN countries for that matter. Then uh, we know we did know the current structure. Uh, we identify our current champions that would help me in uh, as also as an advocate for women economic empowerment. Uh, we institutionalize local development council wherein uh, there should be a representation of women in uh, that council. Uh, we do um, uh, plans and policies that addresses women's issues because there is already this representation of women in my council. They, uh, she's the one that brought the issues of women uh, so that it will be, they will be given voice and uh, whatever programs and projects and activities that are being planned, it is uh, being implemented. Then we do build competencies, uh, core competencies of women and provide economic uh, access. We have a lot of livelihood uh, uh, assistance in our municipality where a lot of presidents are act, uh, of the organizations that we engage with our women. Then we execute the plans, we sustain and scale up. And uh, also right now, uh, what I'm doing is I'm sharing knowledge, uh, uh, whatever gains that we have with our women economic empowerment. Then uh, of course, our ordinance, our uh, unpaid uh, care work ordinance is not uh, perfect. Uh, yet because it's still uh, it's improving actually. Uh, in fact, our ordinance has gone a long way already and it has been presented by my colleagues in other municipalities in Eastern uh, Samar, but still uh, we do uh, have this call to action by our local leaders, especially in policy influence and in policy influencing and programs to enact policies uh, as well as legis legislation that will support and invest care economy, as well as the reduction of our dose and uh, difficult care tasks of women and families through investment in public care related services. Uh, when it comes to research and knowledge generation, hopefully more research is uh, uh, undertaken to investigate the impact of access to public services exacerbated by the pandemic on women's time, use, and well-being. Uh, example, to incorporate questions related to uh, unpaid care work in the national census. This is what uh, was actually, I was telling that we will be conducting uh, CBMS, community-based monitoring system, and we will be including questions regarding unpaid care work and monitor uh, just to surface the situation regarding unpaid care work and monitor the impact of policies and investments regarding unpaid care work. Then we do also call for private uh, sector partnership. Uh, I know that, uh, like for example, Oxfam that are uh, that is here in my municipality since Typhoon Yolanda, we, we have a good partnership and uh, we, in fact, uh, uh, they're already part of uh, my governance in the municipality and we have if we have advocacies regarding women's children uh drr and climate change uh partnership private partnership is very important and uh, yes uh care work is teamwork uh in every household uh, it's really very good where uh boys and girls men and women husband and wife work together and that is teamwork and that is one of the values that we nurture uh, in our in our case in the Philippines, uh, family or charity begins at home. If there is teamwork in uh, every household, there will also be it. it will produce a better better uh, children, uh, uh, very good children. Uh, uh, we try attitude children, and together we can have a bright uh, future for this world. Thank you very much, and good afternoon.
Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Tony Melkor Mergel. So we have Mayor with us here to take a few questions. Uh, we have time for four questions. So we're just going to bring uh, Mayor into the our stream. How are you doing, sir? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, amazing sharing. Great case study. Now, my first question that's coming to you is, how have you become an advocate for women's economic empowerment? Yeah, uh, maybe because I was uh, brought by a very big family. We are actually 13 in the, the family and uh, I am very familiar how household uh, works really operates in every household. And uh, when the when, uh, unpaid care work was introduced to me, it was really very easy for me to understand and to support the project. And of course, uh, with the recognition that really uh, women uh, as this big contribution in uh, in uh, making this uh, world a better place to live. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question we have is, we know that social norms are probably the most difficult thing to address and change. What has been your strategy to tackle social and cultural norms and what results have you seen? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, we do a lot, we do a lot of awareness uh, raising in our municipality regarding uh, uh, social protection concerns or unpaid care work or women economic empowerment. Uh, as I was saying during my presentation, uh, uh, a lot of our programs, projects, and activities uh, has element regarding uh, women's protection, children's protection, or women economic empowerment. So. Uh, through this awareness raising, uh, people uh, appreciate it, actually. Uh, they appreciate what uh, I was doing. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, women's protection or children's protection or social protection is good uh, politics because if uh, people will see you doing uh, some good things about, this, uh, about women, about children, they will like you very much and uh, they will vote you again and again and again. Thank you, sir. Now, could you tell us more about the importance of collaborating with NGOs, the private sector, and that sorts? Yeah, uh, like for example, my municipality, uh, we are a fifth class municipality with limited resources and uh, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of services that are covered by the local government unit. So, uh, we do a lot of partnerships with uh, private organizations to help us in the delivery or address uh, uh, gender inequality, for example. So it's really very important uh, that I do partnerships because uh, uh, the, 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 the way I see it here, uh, I do agree with uh, Maria Victoria of uh, Social Watch Philippines, that social protection is not given much attention actually, especially by the politicians because they're thinking it as actually a cost rather than as uh, an investment. So uh, when it comes to budget, uh, there is only, although there is this earmarked budget for gender and development where uh, women economic empowerment and unpaid care work programs, projects and activities can be taken from, from that uh, uh, airmark fund, still it is not uh, actually enough to, to help address uh, the address the, the address uh, so social uh, inequality or women inequality or, 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 or social inequity in, in our municipality. So it is really very important that we do a private uh, partnership especially those organizations that have bias when it comes to uh, poor uh, families, uh, vulnerable families, among others. Thank you, Mayor. And one last question before we let you go. We thank you so much for your time thus far. From your own experience, how can we involve more men in advocating for women's economic empowerment? Yeah, uh, the, the, the Department of uh, the Interior and Local Government uh, should uh, ensure that all the mayors have this uh, strong governance when it comes to social protection. 
I've been experiencing this uh, because I am uh, my municipality is still uh, a local governance award, and uh, one of the criteria there are social protection, and uh, the 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 government should include as one of the criteria the program projects and activities of the local government unit that involves uh, social protection as well as women economic empowerment. I think uh, in that way, all the local government units will be pressured to uh, to have uh, those programs, uh, projects, and activities uh, for social protection institutionalized in their respective local government unit, and uh, it might help uh, address uh, social protection issues. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time, and thank you for your great and real candid answers. I'm sure, you know, the women, especially in the forum, are truly empowered by that, even looking at some of the chats. They thank you, and I thank you for your thank time. Thank you very so much. Have a great evening.